Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Spilling Studio. My name is Sam, and this week we have seven new ARE practice questions designed to help you pass your next exam. There's one question per exam topic and a bonus question at the end, so stick around. First up is practice management. The design stage for a new elementary school has recently finished and the owner is getting ready to send the project out for bid. It is important to the owner that the compensation type encourages the contractor to be efficient. Which compensation method would encourage the contractor to be most efficient? Stipulated sum, cost plus a fixed lump sum fee, percentage of construction, guaranteed maximum price. Feel free to pause here to answer. The answer is cost plus a fixed lump sum fee. Each of these compensation methods have different advantages, but they differ on who the advantages are for. Some of these are better for the owner and others are better for the contractor. So let's talk about who the advantages go to. Percentage of construction is the contractor's favorite. The longer construction goes on and the more expensive it is, then the more money the contractor makes. There is no incentive here for the contractor to finish the project quickly and under budget, because if they do, then the savings goes to the owner and the contractor does not get a cut of those savings. A GMP, or guaranteed maximum price, gives the advantage to the owner. The contractor guarantees the owner a fixed maximum price to complete the project and if it actually costs less, then the owner receives those savings. If it costs more, then the contractor must cover those costs. Stipulated sum is more of a neutral option. It is the most common compensation method and is always used for competitive bidding. With this method, the contractor agrees to complete the work for a certain amount of money in a certain amount of time. If the project actually costs more, then the contractor absorbs those costs. If it costs less, then the contractor keeps that money. There are no savings to the owner, but they know exactly what the project will cost from the beginning. Now, that sounds like it would be our answer, right? Well, there's an even better option, and that is cost plus a fixed lump sum fee. This method encourages the contractor to be more efficient because if the contractor can reduce costs to the owner and finish the project quickly, then the contractor still gets that fixed lump sum fee. So this option incentivizes the contractor to finish the project as quickly and efficiently as possible. Because if they spent less time on the project, that means they spent less money, making their lump sum fee a bigger profit. Next up is project management. A contractor is reviewing a contract for the renovation of a local church. In the contract, the phase time is of the essence is mentioned. What does this mean? The contractor must complete the project as quickly as possible. The contractor must complete the work by the date specified. The contractor must start work as soon as the contract is signed. The contractor must begin sourcing materials before signing the contract. Pause here to answer. And the answer is, the contractor must complete the work by the date specified. In normal day-to-day -day life, we would all say that time is of the essence means to do it as quickly as possible. But that's not the case in the world of contracts. If the contract has specific dates listed, then it will include the phrase time is of the essence. This means if the contractor signs the contract, they are agreeing they believe the amount of time given is reasonable and they can complete the work by that date. If they do not complete the work by that date, then they may be in breach of contract. And when you breach a contract, there are usually consequences like liquidated damages. If you've had a project in construction, you've probably noticed the contractor always stressing about the schedule, and this is why. It is very important for them to complete the job on time. That's also why we as architects have to return submittals and RFIs within a certain amount of time. Now on to programming and analysis. An architect is working on a life safety plan for a new community center. Which of the following are required to make the site accessible for egress? Select three that apply. Level changes cannot be greater than a quarter inch. Walkways must be at least 36 inches wide. Sidewalk slopes cannot exceed one to 10. Sidewalks must have handrails. Handrails must be at least 34 inches tall. Pause to answer.
And the correct answer is, level changes cannot be greater than a quarter inch, walkways must be at least 36 inches wide, and handrails must be at least 34 inches tall. These responses came straight from our accessibility code. I know all this code stuff is overwhelming since there's so much, but you primarily need to focus on spatial related codes. So for accessibility, I would focus your studies on chapter three, building blocks, chapter four, accessible routes, and chapter five, general site and building elements. So let's review our correct answers first. Level changes refers to the vertical change at the ground surface, and this can only be at a quarter inch of a difference. The clear width of walking surfaces, so sidewalks and other walkways, must be at least 36 inches wide. And finally, handrail height must be at least 34 inches tall, and at the most, they can be 38 inches tall. Now for our incorrect answers. Sidewalks do not have to have handrails. Handrails are only required at stairs and ramps, and they must be on both sides. The route is not required to have handrails if their slope is greater than 1 to 20 or 5%. The route is only required to have handrails if their slope is greater than 1 to 20 or 5% because then it's considered a ramp. And that leads us to our second incorrect answer, sidewalk slopes cannot exceed 1 to 10. This should actually be 1 to 20, 5%, right? So in order for a walkway surface to be considered a walkway and not a ramp, the slope must be at or less than 1 to 20. Next, we have project planning. An architect is specifying materials for a new grocery store. Which type of glass is safe, provides security, acoustic control, and has the ability to be decorative? Laminated glass, tempered glass, wire glass, or reflective glass? Pause to answer. And the correct answer is laminated glass. This glass does a lot of things, doesn't it? It's the tacky glue of model making. Laminated glass is made of two or more pieces of glass that are bonded together by a type of plastic called polyvinyl butyl resin. This plastic layer has many advantages. It holds the glass pieces together if broken, making it a safety glass. It makes the glass very strong, allowing it to be used in bullet resistant and high security applications. And it helps with sound control. The plastic layer has a dampening effect on sound, and the multiple layers of glass further aid the acoustics. And finally, because this glass is made of multiple layers, it allows for a decorative interlayer to be inserted between the layers. Our other options don't quite check off all of these boxes. Tempered glass is one of the strongest glass types. It's four times stronger than annealed, and it is considered a safety glass since it breaks into thousands of small pieces instead of large sharp pieces that are more dangerous. Wire glass has a piece of wire mesh embedded into the glass. It's also not as strong as the other options and is actually considered hazardous when broken. So it's the opposite of safe. Reflective glass has a very thin layer of metal or metallic oxide that helps reflect solar radiation away from the building. The surface does have a really pretty mirror-like appearance, but it does not have decorative capabilities. A brief pause here to remind you that I post new questions every week, so please hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss out on a video. It also really helps me out, so thank you. Next up is project development. See the ceiling detail below. The item labeled X is what? Steel stud, C channel, furring channel, or shim? Pause here to answer. And the answer is furring channel. This is a detail of a bulkhead at a gypsum ceiling and that component labeled X is a furring channel. A furring channel is used to have something for the gypsum board to screw into. So how is gypsum installed? First, you need your supporting structure, which is typically metal framing, AKA our furring channel. Then the gypsum board is cut and screwed into place. After that, it's time to cover the joints and screws. A tape is used at the seams and at the corners. Then a joint compound is applied with a drywall knife. Once it dries, it's sanded and then primed and painted. Next up is construction evaluation. A contractor is reviewing proposals from potential subcontractors. 
Which of the following will affect the subcontractor's price? Select three that apply. The tools needed to complete the work, the hours the workers need to be on site, the phase of the project the subcontractors are needed, the number of times the subcontractor has to mobilize, where the project is located, profit margin of the general contractor. Pause here to answer. The answer is the hours the workers need to be on site, the number of times the subcontractor has to mobilize, and where the project is located. Let's go through these one at a time. For the first one, tools needed to complete the work. Subcontractors typically already have the tools they will need to complete the job. They may need to purchase a few things or rent some, but it is very rare or unlikely that this would significantly change their pricing. The hours the subcontractors need to be on site will change their pricing. If they are working overnight or on the weekends, their price will go up significantly. The phase of construction does not affect their pricing. Typically, subcontractors work on one trade, like painting, so they're always going to show up at the same stage of construction, which in the painting scenario would be after the gypsum has been installed and all the spaces are ready for paint. The number of times the subcontractor has to mobilize will affect their pricing. Mobilizing means getting themselves and all of their equipment on site, set up, and ready to start work. So if this has to happen multiple times, then the pricing would go up. Different locations have different labor rates, material availability, and regulations. So where the project is located would affect the subcontractor's price. And finally, the profit margin of the general contractor would not affect the subcontractor's pricing. They may be aware of the GC's overhead, but it doesn't change the way they bid the project. Subcontractors base their price on their own cost and profit margins. Last but not least, our bonus question is, an owner is reviewing bids that just came in for the construction of a new elementary school. Which variable will have the greatest impact on the bid prices? Subcontractors profit margin, contractors profit margin, the contractors indirect costs, number of bids received from subcontractors. Pause here to answer. And the correct answer is number of bids received from subcontractors. Labor and materials represent about 80% of the construction costs. Therefore, the numbers received from subcontractors will have the greatest impact on the bid price. Like the owner, the contractor will receive multiple bids from subcontractors for the project meaning the GC may get four bids just to do the roof. When that happens, the GC is able to choose a lower cost sub as long as they are qualified to complete the job. So you can imagine if this happens for each category, the price will drop significantly. The profit margin of the contractor and the subcontractor are typically a percentage of the total project construction costs. So this doesn't have the greatest impact. And the indirect costs of the contractor are minimal in comparison to the material and labor costs. That's our questions for this week. Remember to check out the description for links to some of the AIA contracts covered in this video. I've also linked some of my favorite study books, so go check those out. And let me know in the comments what areas you're struggling with, and I'll do my best to cover it in the next video. Thank you all for joining. Please subscribe, and good luck on your next exam. You got this!